Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this conversation about the rights of Palestinian children in Gaza with Professor Anne Skelton, the chairperson of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Noam Perleg, and I'm from the Faculty of Law and Justice at the University of New South Wales and an associate of the Australian Human Rights Institute, which hosts this event. I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm joining from the unceded land of the Gadigal people and to extend my respect to the elder, past, present, and emerging, and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person who joined us today, and any Indigenous person who is watching the recording. The Gadigal people have been experiencing the colonial practice of targeting children as a practice of elimination for many years. Whether it is the intentional killing or the forced removal of children from their families and their communities, or the disproportionate representation of children in the care and protection system and the criminalization and racialization of indigenous children. These days, all of these practices are legalized and done in accordance to the law. Indigenous children are subject to a complicated way of laws that legitimizes and enables these colonial and racial practices that violate their rights as children and the rights of their siblings, parents, and communities. Living and working on Gadigal land comes with the obligation and the duty to call out these practices, to call out the genocide that the indigenous communities are experiencing here, at this land, and in other parts of the world too. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, described Gaza as a children's graveyard. He made this statement a year ago, in November 2023. The International Court of Justice has addressed the war against children in a series of preliminary measures which were ordered in the light of the alleged violation of the Convention of the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide by Israel. Gaza is currently the deadliest place in the world for children. According to UN data, at least 18,000 children were killed in the last 18 months. 3,800 3, of them, or 21%, were under the age of five, and over 710 were babies under the age of 12 months. It is documented that children as young as one day old were killed too, and an unknown number of children in NICU suffocated to death when hospitals ran out of electricity and their air pumps stopped working. Thousands more children are buried under the rebel or gone missing. Tens of thousands of children have lost limbs or suffer from other physical injuries. It is estimated that over 10,000 children have lost one or more siblings, while thousands more have lost one or both parents. Testimonies of doctors who been to Gaza reveal a targeted killing of children. In a letter sent to President Biden, physicians described their daily experiences of treating children who were killed by not one, but two or more sniper bullets that were shot to their heads. In a testimony given earlier this week to the British Parliament, Professor Nidan Maodo described how a bomb will be dropped on a crowded area and then drones will come and, I quote, pick up civilians' children day after day. End of quote. All children in Gaza is constantly exposed to violence and lack of access to adequate healthcare, and, and statistically, children in Gaza have the highest rates of child malnutrition globally. According to Save the Children, 90% of all schools in Gaza Strip have sustained damage over the past year, and nearly all children in Gaza are out of school. Many are displaced, with over 60% of homes being destroyed. For older, for older children, the disruption of education has created uncertainty and, exact, sorry, and anxiety. Without schooling, young people are at increased risk of, increased risk of ex exploitation, child labor, and early marriage. They are at risk of dropping out of school permanently. For younger children, the absence of schooling threatens their cognitive, social, and emotional development. We are talking about an entire generation that witnessed the physical destruction of their homes, streets, schools, playgrounds, and the entire social infrastructure that supports children, from bakeries to libraries and community centers all deliberately destroyed. The severe mental health trauma will remain a part of the life of children in Gaza forever, impacting future generations and becoming an enduring part of Palestinians' traumatic history. We will talk about the experiences of children and the law with the chairperson of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, Professor Anne Skelton. Professor Skelton is a professor of law at the University of Pretoria, South Africa, where she's a UNESCO chair in educational law in Africa. Professor Skelton is a hold the chair in children's rights, also holds the chair in children's rights in a sustainable world and, in pro and is the program director of the Master of the Law, Advanced Studies in International Children's Rights Law at Leiden University in the Netherlands, where she is joining us from today. She also has been the chairperson of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child since May 2023. Professor Skelton, welcome and thank you very much for joining us at these early hours of the morning in Leiden. 
To begin the conversation, uh, I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about, uh, in a few words, what role does the UN Committee of the Rights of the Child has to play with, uh, in the war against Gaza, and how it came to make some recommendation for Israel just two, just two months ago in September 2024? Yes, I will. Um, thanks very much, Noam, for um, hosting this webinar and for giving me the opportunity to share some of the committee's experiences relating to Gaza. So firstly, the Committee on the Rights of the Child is made up of 18 members who um, sit in Geneva three times a year, and our core mandate is to review states' parties. In other words, to check where how what progress states are making in relation to implementing the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So there's a regular reporting cycle that states come up for. The mandate is somewhat limited in the sense that we don't just have an open uh, mandate to go and investigate children's rights abuses elsewhere. Special rapporteurs are more um, set up to do that. But the committee is is uh, tends to be more passive. However, the committee also can make statements um, that uh, from time to time issue press statements and put statements on its website. And from early on, in fact, from the 10th of October last year, the committee already made its first statement relating to the impact, um, of course, of the 7th of October attack and then the retaliation. And so the committee has actually been um, among among the treaty bodies, because there were nine of them, uh, among the most vocal. And that makes perfect sense because of the huge impact on children. So I think um, from our perspective, we simply could not remain silent given what was unfolding and what was happening to children uh, in Gaza. Um, but as luck would have it, the cycle determined that Israel was to report to the committee this year. And they originally were scheduled to come in January. Um, and that would have been a very heavy session because we were also reviewing Russia that, that January. So we reviewed Russia in January and um, Israel asked for a postponement, but then they eventually came to the committee in September. So um, this gave the committee an opportunity to ask them questions. Of course, we asked them questions about children in Israel. But then we also asked them about, well, we also asked about Palestinian children living in Israel and, um, you know, other groups of children living in Israel. But then we had a dedicated part of our discussion where we talked about um, the children in Palestine and the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Now, interestingly enough, it's not the first time that the committee has asked questions about Gaza, because I saw we saw from our previous the committee's previous concluding observations that uh, this had come under questioning. But obviously, it was by this time uh, in in September this year a very hot topic for the for the committee to deal with. Um, so um, the the committee's approach was that we. Um, we asked our questions that related more to Israel in the first part and that then um, in the second part of our dialogue. And what something that um, listeners might not know is that the, the state puts forward a report. Um, the committee asks for follow-up questions, and we'd already done our follow-up questions, but after the 7th of October, we reissued, we issued a new list of issues um, that we wanted to talk to Israel about. So they knew that we were going to be asking them about what was happening in Gaza. Um, and then we spend six hours in the room um, in a dialogue. And that is a public forum. So there were there were people sitting in the room, but also it was it was live cast on UN Web TV, as all of our hearings are. So um, it it really um was um I think it, it is a moment where this where the delegation is to some extent quite exposed. And it's interesting to me that states still come to the committee even when they're at war and even when they know it's going to be a tough ride. And how was this tough ride? I mean, for those of us who, uh, or those of the listeners who didn't watch the live cast uh, or didn't read uh, the list of mm. issues or Israel response. So... There was a list of issues, yes. very specific questions, and then there was a written document submitted by Israel. Uh, and then there was another set of dynamics that happened in the room. If you can share some of uh, what was uh, in the public forum for those who didn't watch it or didn't read the documents. 
Yes, I will. So, in fact, um, the, the, the answer to our list of questions was very non-committal. So it gave an indication or gave a suggestion that they would not be drawn on issues relating to Gaza. But actually, um, in the dialogue, I think um, we, we, we did manage to get um, quite a lot of answers. Um, but it began um, with the delegation um, setting out, uh, you know, the the. Uh, ambassador actually spoke first, the ambassador to the UN uh, for Israel. And he actually said, look, as far as we're concerned, the Convention on the Rights of the Child does not apply in war. And secondly, it does not apply in occupied territories. And it doesn't apply to us in that in the this occupied territory, at least. So that was their, you know, opening salvo, basically. Um, and of course, they drew attention to the huge impact of the um, 7th of October attacks and subsequent actions on Israeli children. So they were stressing that, um, of course, they um, talked about the kidnappings. Um, and um, But the Committee on the Rights of the Child had consistently also called for the, the immediate release of um, all uh, hostages, um, including, well, especially children, but also with their caregivers. Um, and so um, so that was, you know, very much at the fore. So it was quite emotional. The whole room was a bit emotional. And one of the things that had happened was they brought a, a rather large government delegation. But in their delegation, they also brought a mother who had um, four sons. Her eldest son was killed on the 7th of October and her youngest son was very badly injured. Um, and so she also took the floor. Um, this is unusual. I wouldn't say this happens very often. Um, but I remember that when the committee reviewed Palestine, something similar occurred. Um, and so perhaps this was, uh, you know, a bit of a retaliation to that. It did, um, from my point of view as a chairperson, make it quite difficult because we're dealing with a, a victim who had a story to tell. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the committee did express its empathy towards her situation. Um, but at the same time, we were determined um, and we made it clear that we were going to be asking questions about um, children in Gaza and that our concern was for all children everywhere. We're concerned about any children that are affected by by war and killed in wars and injured in wars and so on. So I think we, you know, we 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 managed to get over that initial hurdle. But I, I would say that it was quite, you know, it was it was fairly tense all the way through. Um, and um, but the committee members who asked the questions, um, I think, stood their ground and asked the question that they wanted to ask. Um, and as I said, um, although. Um, what was very interesting was that the the ambassador said when he told us that the UN Convention doesn't apply, he did acknowledge that international humanitarian law applies, and this is important. And it's and it's absolutely correct um, from the Convention on the Rights of the Child itself, Article thirty eight that deals with children in armed conflict, very expressly says that states parties are bound to follow international human rights law and international humanitarian law. And this became very relevant for the dialogue. And in fact, one of the things that I think was the most um, interesting about this dialogue and that we can perhaps talk about later is the way in which international humanitarian law, even international criminal law and other UN frameworks relating to children and armed conflict all came to the fore in this dialogue. Which is one of the unique, uh, I think, aspects of the concluding observations that you eventually uh, uh, issued in September, where, where you brought in different mechanisms uh, in addition to the UN Com uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child to, that enables you to deal with the complex situation of children in Gaza and on, in Israel uh, as well. So, in that sense, prior to to this uh, uh, session, the law was quite. I mean, despite Israel uh, uh, statement, the law was quite obvious from previous recommendations that the UN Committee made from previous ICJ advisory opinions. The Convention on the Right of the Child applies in occupied territories in addition to other human rights frameworks. Uh, it applies during armed conflicts. Article 38 makes it uh, quite clearly. Again, the ICJ has settled that dispute uh, uh, in a number of advisory, advisory opinions. But then it has to be reaffirmed. Uh, 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 and I think it, it probably helped that the ICJ has issued its latest advisory opinion about the legality of Israel uh, uh, occupation just a few weeks before, before that hearing. 
So if you can, yes. if you can settle, if you can then just give us an, a quick overview of how you framed uh, uh, the different legal uh, uh, layers that governs the life of children in Gaza and set the duties and responsibilities of Israel with that, with that regard. Yes, and if you don't mind, I, I will actually read to you the opening sort of statement from our concluding observations, because I think it puts it out clearly. Um, it talks, it, it welcomes, the committee expresses its appreciation for the dialogue held with the delegation of the state party. Nonetheless, the committee deeply regrets the state party's repeated denial of its legal obligations under the convention in the occupied Palestinian territory, based on its position that the convention does not apply to areas beyond a state's national territory, and that it was not designed to apply in situations of armed conflict. And then uh, we go on to say, in this regard, the committee recalls the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice, including its advisory opinion of 19 July 2024, on the legal consequences arising from the policies and practices of Israel in the OPT, including East Jerusalem, that international human rights instruments are applicable in respect of acts done by a state in the exercise of its jurisdiction inside its own territory, particularly in occupied territories. Um, and then we went on to say that the committee aligning its position with the position of the ICJ reiterates that the convention applies to all children at all times and is directly applicable in all territories over which the state party exercises effective control and reminds the state party of its legal obligations both under the convention and international humanitarian law concerning children in the OPT. So I think what you can see there is the committee um, standing on the shoulders of, of the International Court of Justice, if you like, or deriving from this very recent opinion um, and strengthening our ability to drive home that point that as far as we're concerned, the convention does apply and that we would be, you know, that, that we were making these concluding observations flowing from that understanding. Okay, thank you. So that's, so that's the applicable law. And then comes the question mm -hmm. of facts. And the question of facts is, where do you get your facts from? Uh, how do you know what's going on the ground? You've mentioned before that you don't do country visits, you have no investigation uh, uh, capacity, um, but then decisions or recommendation is to be made based on what's happening on the ground to children. So where does the committee come to know or has, uh, gets its knowledge from? And whether the situation in, uh, with, with respect to other countries but is different when it comes to times of hostility and an ongoing armed, armed conflict and genocide? Yes, well, one of the things, one of the advantages we have is that we do have access to other UN bodies and agencies, and we had a number of briefings as the committee um, by people on the ground um, in Gaza. Um, and we, you know, for example, from, um, from OHCHR and UNICEF, uh, as well as um, we had a lot of information from UNRWA, and OCHA, the, you know, the humanitarian organizations of the UN working in that district. So we had a lot of very direct information from people on the ground, and we were very appreciative of the fact that they were willing to, to do that because, you know, it's very, uh, it's, it's hard for them being in that area to take time to, to, to brief us, but we did that online. So uh, most of our information um, was from um, desk reports from officers and then an act actual interaction. Um, and um, we also had had a briefing from the special mechanism relating to um, Palestine. So I think we we had had been able to gather quite a lot of direct and very up to date information um, that informed the way that we asked our questions. Um, we obviously internally in the committee also discussed beforehand what kind of language we would use. You know, um, with what how far a committee like ours can go down the line of talking about genocide or apartheid. And, and so we, we, we were very well prepared for, for this dialogue. Okay, thank you. And then, so let's get to it. So what did the committee recommend, given the scale of violence that children uh, uh, have experienced in the last uh, uh, 13 months? Uh, if, we can, if you can walk us through some of the main recommendations uh, that the committee made and what are, what are the expectations uh, uh, from Israel in that, in that regard? Yes, well, perhaps um, what I can do is, is uh, I've got some highlighted pointers that I had pulled out. Um, 
So in relation to torture and ill treatment of Palestinian children in the occupied Palestinian territories, and actually this includes not only Gaza, but the West Bank as well. Um, and um, we talked about the fact that uh, we were concerned about solitary confinement, the use of electric shocks, um, and various other forms of violence amounting to torture. Um, and we said, the committee is of the view that no national security concern or situation of armed conflict can justify the torture and ill treatment of children and reminds the state party that such practices are a serious violation of the human rights treaties which the state party has ratified, including Article 37A of the convention and a grave breach of Article 32 of the fourth Geneva Convention. There's another example of, well, that's uh, international humanitarian law being tucked in to, to the recommendation as well. And here the committee um, insisted on the fact that the state strongly urges the state party to take all measures to end all forms of torture and ill treatment, including sexual violence, against Palestinian children and children in the occupied territory, remove all children from solitary confinement and halt and prohibit recruitment of child detainees as informants for security forces, which was one of the things that had been raised particularly for us. Um, there are a whole lot of them, and I don't want to identify them all, but um, night raids and excessive forcible home invasions was another thing that we flagged and said that that had to end that practice had to end, and that if searches were to be conducted, they would could only be done according to judicial warrants. Um, let me fast forward to the part on the occupied territories alone. Um, here again, the committee drew on the advisory opinion, um, and um, here it says, drawing attention to the advisory opinion of 19th of July, 2024, and the orders of 26 January 2024 and 24 May 2024 of the ICJ on the application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in the Gaza Strip, in other words, South Africa versus Israel, uh, the committee urges the state party to A, urgently take measures to ensure that children and civilian infrastructure are not targeted, that incidental loss of children's lives, injury to children, and damage to civilian objects are not caused in violation of international humanitarian law and immediately comply with the orders and advisory opinions of the ICJ. And that, of course, speaks volumes because if you, as we all know, the ICJ has called for a ceasefire. So um, we, you know, we can actually say that, that, uh, that, well, that, that at least the hostilities have got to cease so that all the services can get in for children. Sorry, I've just dropped my papers on the floor, just going to get them. Um, and um, so I, I think that that, um, again, you, you see the committee kind of resting on the fact that there are other very authoritative voices that have spoken out here. Um, it then goes on to talk to say, ensure that armed forces and security forces abide by their obligations under international humanitarian law and human rights law, including by providing clear instructions to protect children in all circumstances and prevent any possible killing and injuring of children in line with international humanitarian law principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution. Incidentally, during the dialogue, um, the legal expert from Israel, you know, ac acknowledged that this is binding on them, that international humanitarian law is binding, but insisted that they are upholding the principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution. So in other words, their argument was not that international humanitarian law doesn't apply, but that they were abiding by it. Um, so uh, we also asked them to carry out prompt independent, effective and transparent investigations into the violations of international human rights and humanitarian law committed by the armed and security forces since the 7th of October and before that date in cooperation with international fact-finding missions and international criminal court to ensure accountability. So they're flagging in international criminal law as well. Um, we also uh, said bring perpetrators of human rights violations to justice and provide compensation, recovery, and social integration services 
for all child victims. And then we also made reference to um, UN frameworks. Now, I should just explain that, perhaps just as an aside, maybe not everyone knows, that 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 um, in New York, in the United Nations framework there, there is a um, special representative of the Secretary General that deals with children in armed conflict. And um, the, a, annually, there is a report by the Secretary General to the Security Council um, on uh, the situation of children in armed conflict. And that um, committee has a um, special committee that monitors six grave violations of children's rights. And the six grave violations um, are all very obviously happening um, at the moment in Gaza. And so, um, and, and in addition to that, the, um, the, this, there is a, an annexure that goes with this report, um, which is often referred to as the list of shame. And it is the list of um, armed forces, either state or non-state, that have that are found by the Secretary General uh, um, to ha have committed the six grave violations, one of the six grave violations. And if they are on this list, then they're supposed to cooperate with the, um, the special representative of the Secretary General and to make plans to end this, uh, these grave violations. Um, now, in the most recent report of the Secretary General, the Israeli armed and security forces were listed on the, the list, together with two Hamas um, armed forces as well. So they were all put together. And during the dialogue, I asked um, the legal, the, the, the delegation, but the legal representative answered, um, you know what uh, how they how they would respond to the fact that they had been listed on there and honestly i didn't think that they would answer that question um but they did and they said that they were shocked and horrified to be included on that list together with the uh, hamas entities um, and um, they had previously always cooperated with the special representative of the secretary general but now they were you know, now they were wondering whether they would actually continue to engage. So one of the things then that we we asked for um, in the concluding observation was sign an action plan with the United Nations to end and prevent the killing and maiming of children and attacks on schools and hospitals and work with the special representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Children and Armed Con Conflict to urgently put in place measures to better protect children. And then we also went on to say, cooperate with and support the work of UNRWA in providing education and health services to Palestinian children, halt the demolition of and strikes against UNRWA operated schools in Gaza and ensure the safety of UNRWA operations throughout the occupied Palestinian territory, including in East Jerusalem. Now, Probably later in this discussion, um, you're going to ask me, so what happens if Israel doesn't do any of these things, right? Because my students ask me this all the time about the committee and its, um, <laughs> its lack of teeth. But the interesting thing that is that already um, the Knesset has not only not followed this on UNRWA, but has actually gone in the other direction and is now um, has, has passed a some kind of edict that they are not going to uh, work with or cooperate with with UNRWA. So they've gone a step away from our recommendation in this regard. But we'll just we'll, we can just keep that for further discussion later. But I mean, I think that's an interesting sign. Right. So I've um, Let's, you know, I don't want to be reading for, day, for hours and hours, but, you know, there are pages and pages, so I'm not going to go through it all. I think I've highlighted some of the yeah. strong points and continue to make this point as to how we've, we've been trying to join up all the dots of what everybody has, all these UN bodies have been doing to try to bring about change. Thank you. And we speak about uh, uh, the issue of compliance uh, uh, and maybe accountability uh, uh, in, in a few moments, but I think yeah. you... What the, the recommendation speaks about in different dimensions. Uh, they speak about the immediate action that has to be taken at the moment. You mentioned ceasefire, but also increasing aid uh, uh, and helping uh, uh, issues, uh, treating with, dealing with issues of malnutrition and, and healthcare uh, uh, at the moment, but also about measures that has to be taken once the hostility ends. Um, and I think 
this line of recommendation, these different dimensions in children's life is, is, is captured in, in, the, in the short section that you have about Article 6 yeah, in the concluding observation uh, that speaks about these dimensions in children's life and it speaks about the inherent right to life and then the right to survival and the right to de development of, of children. Uh, and those are the three dimensions, I think, that capture the, 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 the jigs of the, the committee's recommendation, which is first and foremost, protect the right to life of children. Mentioned earlier on, we saw, we saw over 18,000 children uh, uh, died in the last uh, 13 months. Mm. The report that came uh, earlier in this week suggested that out of the verified death, 70% of deaths in Gaza are of women and children. Uh, going, back, also going to the issue of proportionality that you've mentioned before and the justification uh, that Israel invoked that her, her, its actions are, are in accordance to humanitarian law and the, uh, and the rule of proportionality uh, um, uh, and military advantage. Uh, so there's this right to life. And then the consequences of malnutrition, attack on schools, attack on, 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 uh, on the healthcare system, uh, the fact that there is no aid coming into the north of Gaza for six weeks and almost no aid coming or insufficient aid coming to the whole of, the whole of Strip for uh, 13 months affects children's survival, uh, physical survival and other dimensions of the right to survival. And also it has short-term and long-term effects on their on their development uh, as individuals yeah. and the collective. Um, and everything there fits together with this narrative, I think, that the convention that the committee tries to portray in, in establishing the various obligations and duties that Israel uh, Israel has uh, under the convention and other UN uh, human rights mechanisms and, and frameworks. But then the question goes to what you just mentioned, compliance and implementation. Um, so it has been argued, it came to the committee in September that there is a big question mark to the extent that there is no compliance with the provisional measures that the ICG, ICJ has ordered. Um, and then the two months that has passed since you issued your conclusive observation, you've mentioned, uh, you've mentioned the new law that was passed against UNRWA. Uh, and instead of increasing cooperation with UNRWA, we see a bill passed by parliament suggesting that no more cooperation uh, 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 will, uh, will be given to UNRWA and UNRWA has effectively been outlawed. Um, the siege on north of Gaza and the ethnic cleansing there has increased after you issued your conclusive observation, uh, and the death toll of children there has only increased, and no aid has effectively came, came in this part of, of the strip. So where does it leave us? Where does it leave this recommendation and the UN human rights system when you brought together all of the different developments and, and layers and frameworks that are available to protect children um, on the one hand? And on the other hand, we see can use different adjectives here, and I won't use all of them, but ineffective or, or lack of implementation on the ground. So where does it leave children and where does it leave the human rights system? Yes. I I know, and I, I've been on many platforms lately where this is the topic of, you know, like is, ha, have, has international human rights law and international humanitarian law basically passed its sell by date is is it just not working anymore um and what what can be done and i i noted that um francesca albanese a couple of weeks back said you know we'll miss international law when it's gone so in other words uh, that's the other side of it yes on the other hand we can say it's all not working but if what do we replace it with what do we do without it um it seems like it could be worse without it um so is there any point even? Does this have any meaning? Is it just words on paper? Well, I think it do does depend on, on your perspective. But first of all, um, there is a kind of um, declaratory value, I, I would say, in this process having been um, carried out and fulfilled. And as I said at the beginning, I still find it kind of surprising that states even bother to come to the Committee on the Rights of the Child during um, a war. Um, and um, I know that for people who are working on the ground, it does have meaning because they are working tirelessly every day, feeding people, getting water to people, trying to deal with sanitation and trying to bring health services to people. And it's almost as though um, it, it is a way of recording what is happening as well. It is a way of it's 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 collecting information, putting it in the public domain, and if ever accountability is going to happen in the future, at least we have this documentation, and we have it's almost like a testimony that was that was made, in which, um, you know, certain acknowledgements were made, um, 
but by by the Israeli delegation, but of course with with plenty of justification and and explanations from their side as well. But there were moments where I was sort of feeling, well, are we just providing too much of a platform here for you know the justifications? But but I also think it, it, there is a value in getting that out um, in the public domain, um, and that people who who work on the ground have said to me that they. They they do find value in it. So if it if it brings some some sense that what's happening on the ground is being noticed at an international level, of course, in this war, there's a lot of international media attention, but also just that when legal fora or quasi legal fora, um, you know, take take note and and stack up the list of of uh, rights violations, I think there is some value. But I mean, of course, uh, I also feel um, that we're very impotent in the face of the fact that nothing that we say seems to make very much difference on the ground. Um, but I mean, that's the same as, you know, the ICJ must have the same feeling of impotence, I suppose, uh, in a way. So we could all say, well, it's pointless. We might as well pack up and go home and not bother with all of this. But what's the alternative? You know, that's what I keep coming back to. What is the alternative? We we can only use what we have at our disposal um, whilst the war rages on and hope that when it stops, some of the recommendations will be helpful towards re rebuilding. And uh, something else, Noam, that the committee talked about was the environmental impact of the war. And, and, you know, all the unexploded ordinances that are there, which we know children are far more likely to be injured by than adults. Um, so there is also some guidance on when when the madness stops and the rebuilding has to begin. Um, there, there is some guidance on that as well. So part of it is, like you said, it's a, it's a measure for accountability and documentation, uh, but also, I mean, Reflecting on children's rights law as a project, I mean, we are a week away from celebrating 35 years of the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child by the General Assembly in 20 November 1989, sorry, and we are celebrating at the same time 100 years since the League of Nations adopted the Geneva Declaration on the Rights of Children in 1924. And this is where many considered, uh, that moment in 1924 is considered by many to be the, the birth of international child rights law. And I wouldn't say ironically, but this declaration came in the aftermath of the First World War. And the idea behind this declaration was to shield and protect children from the disproportionate effect that adult-made wars have on them. Uh, and the, the major loss of life and lives and family members that children experience in Europe in, uh, uh, during the First World War. And in the aftermath of it, and the, and the famine that, that spread in Europe. So the Geneva Declaration is all about protecting children during and after armed conflicts. Fast forward to 1989, we have a much more elaborated binding document that tries to do it exactly the same to, in many respects. On the, the provision about the right to life, provision about the environment, provision about children in armed conflict. We have an additional optional protocol about the rights of children uh, in armed conflict. And then we have this moment. Um, and, and this moment, I think, tells us maybe something not about necessarily about the law, which we've covered, but also tells us about children uh, and what they can expect from us and from legal mechanisms and from politicians in, with respect to their uh, uh, to their position in the world and 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 there is how cheap their life might be or cheap of some the life of child of some children uh, uh, might be and you spoke about the aftermath and recommendations that were made about how the aftermath of recovery and rehabilitation uh, can take place and I wonder if what's you 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 think might be the the, the 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 space that children might have in in that regard, and what space they should occupy uh, in the day after and the rebuild of their society and their lives. Yes, well, let me just start with just going back a little bit to your point that was made about the hundredth anniversary of the nineteen twenty four declaration. This actually um, this um, his history and the storyfying actually came through in in the dialogue as well um because in the opening um the ambassador uh, invoked the uh, memory of Janusz Korzak who was a Polish Jew um who um was a, a children's rights activist um during the second world war 
and um, he died um, in uh, Auschwitz, um, or maybe it wasn't Auschwitz, maybe it was Treblinka, uh, Treblinka, Treblinka sorry, um, and um, during the war with all the children that he had been looking after and that had eventually been sent off to the camps. So there was an invoking of this um, memory uh, during the opening. And in the dialogue, in the, in the closing, in my final two minute speech, um, I actually um, I flagged this. I said, uh, the ambassador recalled the great Polish child rights advocate, Janusz Korczak, and we honor his memory too. This year is the 100th anniversary of the declaration on the rights of the child signed here in Geneva, itself inspired by war, as it was Eglantine Jeb's empathy for the starving children of the enemy that drove her work that culminated in the declaration. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, which this committee oversees, is the only human rights convention that includes the word love. The preamble recognizes that children should grow up in an atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding. It also says that children should be brought up in the spirit of peace, dignity, tolerance, freedom, equality, and solidarity. And then I asked, were the drivers naive when they said those words in the preamble? And I said, we don't think so. We still think that children should grow up in an atmosphere of, of peace and understanding. So, and and we and I ended off by saying the the and ending the war is the only way to fulfill the promise of the convention. Um, and so there was this kind of you know this invoking of history, this invoking of um, child rights uh, activists um, in the past. Um, and I, I think that that it it is a moment at which we are sort of. We, we've come back a whole cycle and we're back in the situation. As I mentioned, Eglantine Jeb was worried about starving children in Austria and Germany after the First World War because there was a blockade that was stopping food getting to them. And I mean, how obvious uh, is there a parallel with that, with the situation in Gaza where children are st also facing starvation due to, you know, UNRWA being blocked and, and not being able to get in. So, I mean, um, it, it, it is a stark reminder of, of where we are. And there is such heavy um, ironies almost in all of this. Um, but I also think we've, we've come to a point as well where the international, you know, children's rights has often been a little bit sealed off from the rest of international human rights law, let alone the other fields of international law. And I think that one thing that this dialogue did and that these concluding observations show is there's a kind of coming together. So at the moment when we can also all feel hopeless about international law and its uh, lack of impact, we can also see that actually some interesting things are happening where states like South Africa are bringing cases to the International Court of Justice. And since then, um, four states, including Australia, have brought a case to the ICJ on um, the lack of access to education in Afghanistan. So we, we do see um, states actually starting to see that perhaps their obligations to protect children in times of war go beyond their own states and actually mean that they need to be, you know, in this, that spirit of solidarity, trying to hold states accountable through the instruments of justice that we do have. Moving on to your last question about going forward. Um, it still feels like it's a long way to go before we will get there, I know. But I, but I think um, already... Um, there are, you know, discussions happening. And, I, and of course, children um, must be part of those solutions. Um, also um, about rebuilding, about rehabilitation, but also about commemoration and how, how that will be done. Um, I think all of this um, uh, needs to be. And, and, you know, bringing us back at the end of the day to um, – Peace building. We, we talked with the government about the fact that in the last concluding observations, the committee had stressed a great deal about the need to promote peace building. And this is not just only amongst, of course, not just Palestinian children, it's Israeli children as well that need to be educated about the need for peace. It feels like it's, it's very far away. But again, what had happened was that Israel, in the meanwhile, had actually introduced a new aim of education in Israel, which was to prepare children for participating in war in the in the armed forces um 
So we said, you know, you're going in completely the wrong direction. And we again reiterated that importance of educating children for peace and, you know, learning from children about peace, because often children are able to, to, to play and connect across the divides that adults simply have lost the ability to do. Thank you. In the beginning of you mentioned that Israel was originally scheduled to appear before you in January, but then you had uh, to deal with, with Russia. Uh, so I was wondering if you can join, uh, this is always a tricky exercise, some comparison between this current moment and this war and this genocide and other uh, areas of conflict. So in the committee reviews those areas, those states involved in conflicts all the time, all countries of the world, but the U.S. Uh, uh, come to report to the committee. So you had Russia, you had Syria a few years coming uh, uh, during the civil war a few years ago, nearly 10 years ago, uh, Sudan, Yemen. Um, are there any parallels that you can draw or is this, are we talking about something exceptional that requires a, a different attention or different treatment comparing to other conflict zones when it comes to the uh, effects on, on the rights of children? Yes, um, I think I can. First of all, just to mention, just as an aside, Noam, that the uh, the United States does report to the committee on the two optional yeah, protocols, one of which is on children and armed conflict. Um, so, for example, it's not beyond possibility to ask the United States of America about all of the weapons that they've been supplying um, when they come up, which is next year. Uh, the U.S. Is, is slated to appear before the committee next year. Um, so going back to all of the the various different states and how the committee has engaged. Um, and I think we should also mention, you know, just how invisible some of the conflicts are as well, like Sudan, Myanmar. Um, the committee does, uh, in its statements, flag the concerns about those um, states as well. Um, and, and the I mean, the situation in Sudan is absolutely desperate at the moment, and yet it just doesn't get the same media attention. Um, and unfortunately, Sudan hasn't come to be reviewed by the committee uh, recently and isn't slated anytime soon. So it makes it difficult for the committee to engage. But I, I remember that the dialogues with um, Palestine and Syria were similarly intense and that the concluding observations um, were also quite strong. But of course, you know, it's, it's it's different depending on whether you are talking about the state that ha that is the the most active or the stronger ones like Russia and Israel compared with um, countries like um, Palestine was very, very different. Um, Syria also very interesting because the committee has engaged quite a lot of, with the situation of children in the camps in northeast Syria. So the aftermath of war and what happens when children get stuck afterwards is something that um, the committee's dealt with also through its communications procedure. Um, and that's another interesting avenue is whether is to what extent the communications procedure um, could be used. But unfortunately, you know, that not only 53 states have ratified the communications procedure. So that will make it more difficult to use that as an avenue. At least the convention is ratified by all states except the United States. And therefore, that gives us a you know much bigger inroad. So I would say um, I do think the the review of Israel was the the highest point in terms of this coming together of all the different strands of international law i don't think the committee has done that in quite the same way before but i do think that the kind of um willingness um of the states to come and the willingness of the committee to truly engage with um the situation of children in armed conflict um is on display in all of the states that you've mentioned the optional protocol communication of procedure for uh, uh, is, is, a, is a mechanism that enables children and those who work on their behalf to file direct complaints with the committee, uh, uh, arguing that their rights under the convention has been violated. Neither Israel, uh, Israel is not part of it, so therefore it might be difficult for children to invoke this avenue. Uh, so we are coming to the end of this uh, of this conversation. I would like you then to wear your hat as an academic, uh, and and staying on this uh, 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 on this line of questioning. A few years ago, you were involved uh, uh, in the Advancing Child Rights Strategic Litigation uh, uh, program led by uh, our colleague, Professor Ifa Nolan from the University of Nottingham. And you came up with a series of recommendations and reports and, and manuals as to how children and organizations can uh, uh, advance the rights of children through different legal uh, uh, mechanisms and processes. 
And I was wondering whether you think that children in Palestine and in Gaza, or again, those who work on their, on their behalf and with them, do they have any avenues that they can use either the Convention on the Right of the Child or other legal mechanism to advance the protection of the rights of children? Yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, of course, if we look at the big mechanisms, the International um, Court of Justice, I think only states can bring cases. So um, whether or not children... Um, could you know file um, file papers or supporting ad affidavits to record their experiences might be a possibility. Um, I, I also think that the in the international um, criminal court there is a new energy around ensuring that children's voices are heard and that children's narratives are gathered. Um, so as soon as access is is possible, I definitely see a possibilities of children um, being able to, you know, bring information to or, or provide, share information with the International Court of Justice um, in their in in their follow up. Um, and then when it comes to um, you know closer to the ground, it's it's uh, the the interesting question would be whether or not children in Palestine would be able to take cases in Israel, um, given extraterritorial jurisdiction being exercised in occupied territory. Um, I would say that it's a fairly standard within international. Um, law uh, understanding of jurisdiction that occupied territories do fall under the jurisdiction of the Israeli courts. So that's another avenue that might be able to be explored. Um, ultimately, if children are living in states where they can bring cases to the under the optional protocol, but it's only the 53 states where um, that have ratified, um, then it might be possible for the committee to to also engage um and um the under the 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 third optional protocol on a communications procedure there are two types of procedures one is individual complaints where a child or group of children um can bring a case but they need to be direct victims um and they need to exhaust domestic remedies or at least have attempted to do so but under the inquiry procedure where the committee can be asked to actually go to the country um, and investigate a, a situation, um, there there's no requirement for uh, exhaustion as, of domestic remedies. However, Israel hasn't ratified it. So, you know, as far as this scenario is concerned, it would be difficult to see how it would operate unless one could use the argument of occupied Palestinian territories and then Palestine's ratification does it I don't know. There, there, there may be a, a way through. So I invite all legal academics who like extraterritorial jurisdiction to to start to explore that. But certainly um, I'm interested in exploring how extraterritorial jurisdiction might be helpful in this regard. Thank you. One, one last question before we come to an end. Having heard all of that and, and read the conclusion observation and in light of what Article 4 of the Convention uh, says, what are the expectations and the duties of the international community uh, community in that in that regard with respect to the rights of, of children in Gaza? What do you ex what, which steps do you expect state parties to the convention to take, if at, if any? Well, I think that you know we 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 do expect states parties to um to to work with our concluding observations and to use them and to improve things on the ground as a result of that. Um, and and reporting is a cycle. So Israel will have to come back to the committee in five years time. Um, and we would then be questioning them on what progress they have made. Now, we were doing that already and we were not unable to see very much progress vis-a-vis um, -vis children in Palestine. Of course, there were progress. There was progress we could see in relation to children in Israel. So these, you know, that that's the other thing. We can't we can't forget the children in Israel as well. They are also part of the committee's mandate and part of the committee's work. And so there's always that that balancing exercise. But we do expect, and we do hope that um, Israel will, um, you know, continue to work with our concluding observations as we expect all states to do, and to to fulfil some of the measures that we um, have requested, um, and. Uh, we also will continue to watch what's happening in the other 
um, international human rights and uh, international criminal law spaces to see um, you know, what measures of accountability can be held there. I think it's only if we all work on it together. No one entity is probably going to be able to achieve this, but there is a kind of relentless pressure from the different entities um, of, of the UN plus the International Criminal Court. And um, I think that, you know, gradually one hopes it would make a difference. But of course, we all know that in the end, um, state politics also play into this. So um, unless everyone's playing the same game and that's looking less likely these days, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's unclear how much impact it will have. With this uh, gloomy projection, unfortunately, this conversation should come uh, should come to an end. Professor Anskelton, the chairperson of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, thank you very much uh, uh, for joining us for this conversation and spending an hour with us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for joining to this uh, to this webinar, which was hosted uh, by the Australian Institute of Human Rights. Uh, and thank you for um, especially for Kylie for helping us organizing it. Good morning to you and good afternoon to everyone down down under. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noam.